Some actors begin as child stars, but Liz Smith was the opposite. Almost a granny star when her career took off in Mike Lee's 1971 film Bleak Moments. She soon became a specialist in playing elderly eccentrics. Her doleful but mobile face, creating memorable scenes in the film A Private Function and the television series The Vicar of Dibley and the Royal Family. A latecomer to acting success, she made an even more delayed entrance as a writer, publishing two books in her 80s, with her own illustrations. She'd warned that she might sketch me during the interview. Yours is a very unusual career because it mm. didn't really take off until you were 50. It didn't, do, no. Do you think of it as two lives before Quite and after definitely. that? definitely. There is a definite mark before and after. And uh, it's two different lives, yes. I was looking at the list of your credits and it says... Always old. It says grand, 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 no, man. No, always <laughs> old. Right from the beginning, really, because uh, I did uh, act in little things when I was a child. Because I was an only child and living with my grandma, she sent me out to do things, to mix with other children, really. And... Um, so I did little plays and things from about the age of seven or eight or something like that. But even then, I was playing older women, you know, uh, women in their 50s, in, in, even in little plays. I've never played the young uh, um, romantic lead or anything like that. But the, the main thing was I was a lonely, only child living with a grandma in a, a, a you know, gloomy house and so on. And um, uh, to go out and do these little things, and uh, I messed around, and people laughed, and I thought, this is perfect. I did think that was the perfect thing to do, to make people laugh was wonderful. Normally in an interview I'd ask someone about what their parents were like, and that's very difficult for you, because effectively you, you lost both in different ways lost, by I lost both the age by the age of two. My, uh, when I was two, my mother died. She died in childbirth and the baby died. So that left me... So you lost a mother and a sister? I lost a mother and a sister. And then I had the, the grandparents, the, my mother's parents. They were marvellous to me. But, uh, 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 but that grandfather, he died. He died in a big flu epidemic. Mm. So my father was very young and um, great fun, you know, and I thought a uh, world of him. Uh, but then he just disappeared. I uh, didn't see him again. He, he just... Well, I, I, I was sent to Sunday school, uh, all this thing, you know, mixing with other children and so on. So I was sent to Sunday school anyway, and I came out one day, and there he was waiting for me. He used to call me kid, and so he, he just waved like that. Goodbye, kid, he said. Goodbye, kid. I'm going away. I'll write. Uh, I said, and he backed away from me like that, and that's the last thing I saw of him. I, I waited uh, five years, actually. Uh, before I thought, well, the letter won't come now. Do you feel angry about him? Uh, well, it's made me very odd. Uh, I don't think you can experience all that without having a sort of... It, it's a certain angle it gives you on life. Um, uh, probably that you're not wanted enough. Uh, I, I would hate to have it psychoanalysed, I really would, because I, I don't think it would do me any good, but I'm sure it's made me odd. When you describe yourself as being odd and in the book you talk about yourself being strange, what, what do you mean by that? In what way? Well, I, I don't think you could have had a start in life that was so... Uh, uh, th th you were such a reject and, and, and such an odd thing without it influencing you... In, in 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 some way, and and I think it's I think it's made me just a slight tilt at life, and I don't think I can have the same uh, kind of attitude to life as uh, uh, someone who grew up with a normal family, brothers and sisters and mum and father. Because you are you're wary of very people. wary of people, yes. Um, 
Because you feel you feel a reject, really, by life itself, you see, and um, um, you feel uncomfortable, really, being there. But I was very struck in the book that you describe yourself as being defenceless, but mm. in fact, when you look at your life, mm. you, you're incredibly resilient, aren't I, you? I hang on. I hang on. I, I, I do hang on to uh, something. I don't let go of it. Because of what you went on to do were obviously interested in the kind of entertainment but you yeah. went you had at that stage and this is very early on in the century but you you had cinema and you had variety theater in my life uh, well in, in childhood you would go to cinema and you'd go to variety Four or theater. five times a week yeah. by the time i was about well before i could read it was joyful really and um of course it was silent film so i it was being terrible to sitting near me because you had to read the uh, dialogue to me, you see, off the screen, you know. And I always had to have loads to eat, so I always had bags, and, and I had peanuts, and, and they weren't... I had to crack them, you know, they were in their shells, so crack, and then i have an orange and... <laughs> <laughs> it must have been terrible sitting by me. But I had a wonderful time, though, yeah, so it took me a lot. Uh, there's a very touching story about going to the Variety Theatre. Yes. Your, your grandfather, that yeah. he, he wouldn't let you see any act that had a gun in it. No, I've all, I, I always hate uh, gunshots. Uh, I still do to this day, you know. I hate them in a play or anything like that. And um, uh, we had the Palace Variety Theatre, it was in those days, and uh, in Scunthorpe, you know. And um, uh, the... Uh, um, Ladies who showed you to your seats wore little, little frilly pinnies, and um, uh, they used to stay in a box at the side of the, and they used to draw the red velvet curtains to make it private. You see, so uh, uh, grandfather had an, uh, uh, an arrangement with these ladies that when there was going to be a gunshot, uh, would you come and collect our Betty, and. Uh, take her up to your place, you know, so she doesn't hear the gunshot. So they used to uh, come a few minutes before that act, you know, and they used to um, come and say, Mr Foster, or oh, Mr Foster, mm. well, Mr Foster, mm. there'll be a gunshot in about five. All right, you take our Betty. <laughs> <laughs> our Betty was taken up to the box and the, and the red velvet curtains were drawn and there was a big box of chocolates always came out and... And I was happily, and then when the gunshot was over, they took me back again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we should settle the, the name because um, you're known now as Liz Smith. But, yeah, um, uh, you, Chris and Betty. Chris and Betty. Yeah, Chris and Betty. Mm. And the hour Betty, which people, in fact, uh, if they don't oh, know well, about this, the well, they, they know from they the royal family, yes, it's well, always hour. But yeah. they always say, yeah, yeah. Uh, our Annie, our Fred, our anything, <laughs> you know, yes, yeah, our Betty. You also were lucky with the first school you um, went to because... Uh, well, I was in a way, but I mean, it wasn't a very good education. No, but it, they, they <laughs> let you act and paint. They got me into dreamland. Which has uh, been Which useful, really yeah. has, I think, sustained me, really, mm. because with my... Mm, quite big ups and downs and hard times and all that, to uh, have that dreamland to, to sort of take the edge off it uh, has probably made me survive it, really. Well, you, you, you describe yourself as, as a strange child. In, yeah, I think I was, really. I think I was. But I think it was that sort of... Um, if I'd been to a, what I call a tight school where you were taught proper lessons, um, I think it would have been more difficult for me. But I, I think to live in this sort of funny old state, but I think I've always lived in it, really, really and truly, when I think about it. As the years have passed, I've still stayed in that kind of odd state. I was amazed... Um reading the memoir by your memory, because you're writing 80 years after the Oh, events. I am, yes, I can and remember you say, right back to But you seem to be able to remember, you describe the, um, the wallpaper in a shop. Oh, yes. You, you say, um, at one point, you say, even after 80 years, I can still see the expression yes. on her face. But have you written any of this down, or it's just all in there? Oh, no, I hadn't written any of it down. Uh, but, but I do, I, I, I remember things. It may be just a sudden expression or, or just a sudden moment but it is kind of imprinted and it stays there. 
And you've played um, a, a lot of Northern grannies as an actress. I have, but yes. are, 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 Is there anything of your gran in those? Have you ever drawn on her? Uh, no, no, not at all, really. I, I do start with each um, mm. one, an, an original. Uh, no, not my gran. Uh, uh, no, all I think about my gran is uh, caring for you and giving you lovely food. <laughs> <laughs> but she's obviously, she's an incredibly important figure in your life, but she seems to have been a very kind woman, your gran. Uh, she, well, she was. She was a, a caring, down-to-earth, northern woman. She said, I will, I will try to stay alive until you're 20. And she said, then you will be alone. And, and there was this terrible sense of loneliness. She would actually spell that out. Though. Oh, yeah, yeah, she said, yes, that was it, you know. Uh, that's, that's what it was, and so that's what she said. Uh, you will be alone. And she said, I will try to leave you enough money uh, to buy a house so that although you will be alone, you will be independent. And if you have a husband who leaves you, you must stay in the house because that will save you to have a home, uh, no matter what happens to you. And that's precisely what happened, uh, that she did die when I was 20. She left me enough money to buy a house. And uh, my husband left me, but he was the one to go uh, uh, so that uh, I, I had a ha at least I had a house to bring up the children. So it worked out, in her northern practical way, she worked it out, and, and that's exactly what happened. But she, she was an early feminist heroine, really. I mean, that, it's incredibly pioneering thinking for a yeah. woman of that generation well, well, to, it is. to think like that. Yes, it, it, it is, because I didn't realise it at the time, you know, mm. when you're 17 and 18 and just going off to war, <laughs> that wasn't yeah. all that kind of thing. It, it seemed a, a big, confusing world. But, but, you know, later on when, you know, as life went on and these things developed, it, was, um, it became sense mm. that, that she was speaking. And the amount of tragedy there had been, as you say, that her, yeah. she'd lost a child, her husband, you'd lost yes. both your parents in different ways. Yes. Did she... Terrible. Awful. What, was there a sense of tragedy mm. in the house? Mm. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, almost haunting, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, doorknobs turning late at night. And, oh, it was, it was, oh, yeah. <laughs> so you were you were frightened, were you? Uh, yes, yeah. spent a lot of <laughs> I've spent a lot of my life <gasps> like this. Really, <laughs> I have. You mentioned the war. You joined. Uh, there's a scene in the book where they turn up and they put out leaflets for the various... That's right, um, they did. ..the various forces, but you, you, you went into the, the Navy, the Wrens. I chose the Navy, yeah. Yeah, I like the uniform, you see. <laughs> <laughs> I like the cut of the jib. It was nice. And you did a, a bit of acting during I did. the war as well, yeah? I did, and, and, and got the feel of it, and it was lovely, mm. but then I became ill because I was in India and I got um, fever, you know. So you'd been to Egypt and India, and that's where you met the man you married. Um, I did. JT, which is now yes. initial, initial used by a famous footballer, but <laughs> at that stage it was... Um, I did, yes, I got my... Friend. Jack, Jack Thomas. Jack, yes, yes. Mm. I, uh, but he liked to be called John. <laughs> John Thomas. So, um, John Thomas. Yes, he must have got a, <laughs> John lo Thomas. a lot of jokes, yeah. Yeah, um, yes. But it was, uh, so it was instant attraction, was it, JT? I suppose it was, really. He was uh, uh, very poetic, tall, dark and poetic, yes, which appealed to my nature, yeah. Well, that's one of the interesting things about it was that one of the things that Trash used to say was his artistic side because yes. he was going to come back from the war and he was going to write plays Oh, and he was going and... to write the great plays, yes, he was, he was. He was going to do that. But that impressed you? Oh, I did. I loved all that. Oh, yes, I love all that. And a lot of people have said that um, women who grow up without their fathers, for whatever reason, it, yeah. it affects their choices of men. But do you, do you feel that? It probably did. Uh, um, I, I liked all the imagination and, and the inventiveness and all the wonderful stories and whatnot that he was going to write and plays and whatnot. But he, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't. It's only part of life's disappointment, you know. 
And we, we talked about a lot, a lot of the bad luck you'd had, but the good luck was your... Um... I always get a slice of good luck. You see, I, I, uh, uh, th- through my life it could be, oh, oh, impossible, it's dreadful, it's going down and again. And suddenly uh, something will happen uh, which will absolutely save my bacon. Well, in this case, it was uh, what you talked about, your granny leaving you that house. You write something in the book about the period just after the Second World War, which I'd never seen expressed in this way before. Um, creativity broke out in a big way. It did. Everybody but everybody oh, was writing. it did. Because this house... Uh, I, I mean, the way I bought it... I, I, one uh, Saturday afternoon, I, I said to my husband, I said, I think I'll go out and buy a house this afternoon. I said, are you coming? And he said, uh, no, I've got a tummy ache. Because being artistic, he had a tummy <laughs> ache. And um, so I said, all right. So I went to the station and I got, um, I bought this Holmes magazine. And I, I just let it flop open. Because don't forget, I was a northerner. I didn't know London. And I got a pencil and I went like that, round a, a house. So there was a house there. And um, I, I, I went through the streets of London saying, can you tell me where this is? And it, it was by the W2, by the Portobello Road. I finally found this house. And it was a big corner house, uh, uh, huge. And uh, so I looked at it and, and I rang the bell and the man came to the door and I said, uh, this house in this magazine, is this, is this it? He said, yes, it is. So I said, thanks very much, I'll have it. And um, so I, I got out my chair and I, and I wrote, <laughs> I wrote... <laughs> The money for the house, and um, and um, the man said, uh, "Would you like to see it?" <laughs> <laughs> and so I did. It was all falling to pieces. The um, the paper was all peeling off the walls, and um, and there were mushrooms all over the kitchen. Great big mushroom. You know. <laughs> Magic house, though. Magic yeah. house. I still dream about that roof leaking. Right. I still have nightmares of, oh, my God, the roof's leaking. <laughs> and then I wake up and realise it's, it's only 60 years ago. And this is where all this, so all this creativity was going on. And so it, this is Portobello Road mm. in, in 1946. Absolutely magic. Everybody went Crazy! Everybody was writing, writing books, writing poetry, writing plays, painting pictures, uh, and the number of plays that were going on. Every garden shed was turned into a little uh, theatre or whatnot. And amazing uh, old costumes being dragged out of old uh, suitcases. It was just, and, and it was it was buzzing. It was lovely and wonderful. I decided uh, I'd treat myself to art school for one year and then um, go as a student actress. Uh, and, and then I, there was um, uh, Westbourne Grove, just round the corner, was a little tiny theatre where they took students. I, I went there. And this was the, um, the Gateway Theatre. That was the Gateway Theatre. Which theater. is, amazingly, yeah. is, is very close to the it's studio. It's very close, yeah. 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 What I loved about it, it was, a, it was a theatre club and it had old sofas with creton covers and mm. a cat sitting there and uh, anyone could pay, anyone could pay them to put a, on their effort, their writing effort. You, 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 got, wow. you, got, you got plays coming in from uh, milkmen, uh, uh, farm labourers, peers of the realm, uh, uh, anybody who fancied writing a script, you could pay them to put it on. You were plunged from the classics one uh, fortnight to um, homespun dialogue. and it Which ma- is good training. For- terribly, but terribly good for people to see what it, uh, it appears like on the stage. It was, it was, it was a marvellous idea, really. Also, impressive audience you had there was Queen Mary used to come. Queen Mary was a great theatre goer. And she promoted all the small... She encouraged all the small theatres. She used to roam around London in an ancient, dark green Rolls Royce. And she used to come out of this um, uh, Rolls Royce. Magnificent! Absolutely magnificent with all her... She used to wear thick, thick jewelled um, and tiaras, and her hair was always uh, crinkly, you know, uh, silver. 
in her fashion. And uh, uh, she, she used to start glittering with diamonds from top mm. to bottom. And th- this funny old shabby old place with, <laughs> and, and smelling of mothballs. It was simply <laughs> wonderful. She used to sit on the front row. But again, looking back, you seem to have been very resolute, very organised to think I'll do a year of art school, a year of drama well, school. Well, it's just what I treated myself. I just, but just you thought, knew what you wanted to do, though. Yes, right from being that big. Right. I've wa- I know, no, well, I've wanted to do and nothing else, just that. Mm. And I've been very lucky to uh, have had so many years of doing it, mm. really. Your dad, as we said, he was what they used to call at the time a bolter, that word they yeah. used. And it, it turned out that uh, JT was as yeah. well. Yeah, I inherited the same uh, pattern, yes. And that led to a, a, a long period of uh, hard labour. Mm. And so you were a single mother with two children. Which... So because of children, I left that house in near Westbourne Grove, uh, to go where there was a garden, a large garden, uh, in this um, um, suburb, which was a world away from Portobello Road and all that life and all that. It was, to me, it was as dead as dead as the dodo. It was really dead there. Mm. And, uh, and I was left there with no money, and um, an isolation. So we're back to isolation yeah. and loneliness again. But also that at that stage, um, you use the word disgrace in the book, uh, it, it was disgraceful to be a single mother to a lot of people. <laughs> you know, people would cross the road rather than speak to you. Well, you were a danger, weren't you? You, were, you might uh, take uh, their husbands, yeah. Exactly. Mm. I was a, a still youngish woman and... Um, um, yeah, exactly. Were you able to trust men after that? Well, I have never trusted <laughs> anybody else again. Right. <laughs> and that was in about 1957. And so s- since then, since your husband left, you've been on your own? Yes, I have, yeah. And was that by choice or is that just how it worked No, it's out? not by choice, it's how it's happened. Mm. It would have been very nice... Uh, to have not not another husband because that's like a, um, but a companion, really. Oh. But it hasn't happened. No, yeah, I'm sorry it hasn't. Were there suitors? There must have been, weren't there? Not really. Uh, no, uh, I, I don't think so. No, hmm. no, no. And in the um... <laughs> I'm probably frightening. <laughs> And you had another um, one of these bits of luck that comes along that this hip, yeah, this hippieish hippie, hippieish American director Charles Maravitz comes to London, and um, you joined his theatre company. And the crucial thing there, because it becomes important later on, is improvisation was his big thing. Well, you see, it's when you look when you're old and you can look back on the pattern of your life. It, it's quite extraordinary the way um, things are laid in a pattern that's got to work out. But you're not aware of it at the time. But looking back, you see the pattern. Yeah, it was like that. Because I'd, so I'd been in the little theatre in West Bond Grove. I'd gone out to the suburbs and left it, finished. But I'd had that lovely feeling of contact with the audience that I... I wanted to recreate. I felt sure it was there that I had that touch with, with, with my audience that I wanted to have. So I got nothing, nothing, nothing. And then in the stage, uh, Charles Maravitz, he came uh, from um, uh, America with The Method. Uh, about uh, in the middle of the 1950s, it was. And it was something new and exciting and, and all that sort of thing. He didn't pay any money. Uh, and um, he chose, I think it must have been about eight, about eight people. And we, we met together most nights, because mostly we had to work during the day to pay the fare to go in. And um, we, we, I, I think we worked together over a year uh, uh, improvising. 
uh, an improvising until we could automatically work with it. We, we, we knew what was coming, you know, we, we knew what we were getting from it. And uh, I think probably about two people came to the first time. And then news got around, uh, there was L London University over the road, and before you could say Jack Robinson, they were all hammering on the door to get in, you know, into this little theatre, and it became a tremendous uh, happening then, and, and, you know, very exciting. Were you confident at that stage as, as an actress? Oh, yeah, we, uh, uh, we were all together, and but we... we we never tried to get any other work because that was it. We were held there by Charles. That was it. That was it. for the rest of our life. I don't know what we were going to live on because he wasn't giving us any money. He used to have a tin bowl by the door and people used to throw money in it. But he used to keep all that himself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, I was there doing that and doing ghastly little jobs. I, I was working... Um, I, I worked in a plastic bag factory. You were briefly a post, a post lady. I was a you? post, post woman. Mm. Oh, it nearly killed me carrying great big bags of post. Then Charles Maravich. Um, oh yeah. After your father yeah. and after JT, he became yeah. the third man to disappear suddenly. Well, he did. Yes, I went. I went to stay. I've been there five years, and uh, I went there and I said to somebody, uh, "Oh, Charles is late today." So they said, "Charles isn't coming." He's, he's dumped us. He, he didn't even say goodbye. Uh, he went to work with Peter Brook. At the RSC. At the RSC, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and that was it, the last I heard of him. So uh, then I was left without anything and uh, didn't know what to do, so I bought the stage again. <laughs> and um, there I saw an advert for Butlins. They used to have plays at Butlins in those days. Now, here was I, penniless, and two small kids, and, uh, uh, I mean, we couldn't afford one day at the seaside, not one day. Uh, so I applied for Butlins, and I got it, which meant then, for years and years, uh, we went to Butlin, uh, to a seaside, for the whole of the summer. Absolutely marvellous. So, you see, there was marvellous again, uh, it just had enough money to pay for a caravan to sleep in you, know, and uh, took the kids for the whole summer. We got so well. It was lovely. And did you think at that stage, because you were going for auditions and being rejected all the time, yeah. that you'd had these acting jobs, did you think it was going to happen for you at some point? I, th I thought, it's got to. Uh, so so uh, I was growing older, and um, people would say, why don't you get a... a a steady job, you know, just uh, uh, to have a proper job rather than muck about, you know. And um, so I said, I have got... I, I knew in here I had to have a chance. And if I was turned down, if I did it and, and I was turned down, I, I think I would have I tried to accept it anyway. And I, I told myself that. And that's how I sustained myself... It was actually, in the end, 15 years. And then one day, I was working in a shop. It was Hamley's. And uh, it was just before Christmas. And I, I'd be about 49, uh, or 50, could be 50. And um, it, it was crowded with people, crowded. And, uh, uh, and somebody at the back lifted a phone up like that and said... And so I fought my way through all the people and somebody told me that um, there was a young director called Mike Lee uh, doing his first improvised film and he'd got the young people but he wanted someone middle-aged who could do improvisation because, you know, people of my age group say, didn't is, do... This no. is what you mean about the pattern in your life, that Maravich leads directly exactly. to Mike Lee. Because it was, done, 50, it was yeah. years later... Yeah. But it was still there, yeah. and 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 that's what had done it. And the the age became right, and the and the improvisation began. And I did, and I got the uh, part in his um, first film, which was bleak moments. Bleak moments. Mm. What you been up to, love? You've been busy, have you? Tea pot here. Okay. I didn't know. What you up to? Where you been? You've been there. 
Oh, poor Molly dressed in tight black clothes. Get him, can you? Never done this before. You must be going mad. You won't show me. You need more trees around. Now listen to what I'm saying. You need more trees around. You hear me? Stop shouting. You need more trees around. Stop shouting. What's the name? Did you think when you were doing this? Did you think I've arrived? This is the this is what uh, I yeah, want to I thought, be doing. Yeah, this is this is this is the moment I've been waiting for. Yeah. It was it, like a wonderful realization uh, that at last I was being given a chance. Mm. It had come. It had come at last. On the next Mike Lee you did, which is um, the least known of his films, I think, um, which is Hard Labour. I, I got it from an American DVD supplier because it's very hard to get hold it, of. I know it, it is. Never, he never includes it in his box sets I or anything. I know he doesn't. I don't know why. I, I think it's a marvellous film because mm. it, was, it was the first one that came out of all his plans and his life. <laughs> Bye. His father was the local doctor there in Salford, and his life had all been... He'd grown up all around there and everything, so it was all familiar. It was all familiar territory and everything with what he wanted to say and so on. And I think... I think he said it beautifully. <laughs> Come in. I'm here, Mrs. Stone. Yes, I know. Take the tray, will you? Because it's you know these phrases are overused about people changing lives, but he did change your life, didn't he? Mike? He changed my life utterly and totally. I mean, I, there's a great big mark right down the middle of like before and after. Is is so different and uh, all I can say is thank you because if that hadn't have happened yeah. that struggle and whatnot and of course it would have grown old uh, worse that I'd gr grown older of course. He's quite cagey about how he works Mike Lee although actors occasionally talk about it but yeah. as I understand it from other actors you're asked to choose someone that you have known. Well I chose wrongly. Life. 